Hey, it's Kirk Harnack here to talk about the Omnia 11 with Cornelius Gould. And also, uh, Paul Kriegler is with us, and I want to uh, welcome Paul in. Uh, first of all, I, I work for the Telos Alliance. See the shirt? <laughs> got the shirt, got the T-shirt. And uh, I do uh, some systems consulting for the Telos Alliance and uh, do some interviews and uh, public education about uh, technologies that uh, broadcasters use that the Telos Alliance offers. Also with us uh, on this little show about the Omnia 11 is Paul Kriegler. Paul from Austin, Texas. Welcome in, Paul. Good to be here. Thank you so much. Glad you could join us. And uh, hey, Paul, give us the little elevator speech about your background and why audio processing is important to you. I just joined the TELUS Alliance two weeks ago. Happy to be here. Um, audio processing has always been from when I had a pirate station in my dad's basement when I was oh, 14, 15 years old. I always wanted my radio station to sound like one of the big boys on the block. <laughs> I spent a lot of time Man. and effort in, uh, educating myself and trying different tricks and tools uh, to try to do so. Oh, my goodness. Hey, so no wonder we get along so well. You, you're mirroring my story there, Paul. I was just saying, this sounds like Corny Gould's story, just in a different city. So also with us is Cornelius Gould. He is uh, the lead algorithm designer for the uh, uh, for Omnia, for Omnia Audio. And Corny is going to be making a presentation to both me and Paul and to you watching this video about uh, some of the technologies. This is a deep, in-depth, deep dive into the technologies in the Omnia 11. This is, uh, we're, you know, this is specifically not a sales video. Uh, Corny has done an enormous amount of research into how to make audio sound good and feel good and 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 be fully loud and print well on your radio dial. So, uh, Corny, welcome in. Glad you're here, you pirate operator. You <laughs> tell us about that. <laughs> oh man, pretty much you can you can mirror Paul's story. Yeah, I got uh, actually it was a detour from rocketry. I I got into rocketry and I wanted to do a remote control glider. Um, you know, boost glider goes up as a rocket comes down like an airplane. Mm. And, uh, but I was pretty young and I wasn't sure if radio waves would work at the speeds that rockets would fly. So I needed to make an experiment, you know, just to, just to see. And once I built, I built a transmitter and, and figured out that I can pretty much transmit anywhere I wanted to, I, um, uh, it might, I flashed back to a, a, a lifelong fascination with radio and, uh, figured I'll make a radio station. Uh, now, a little thing here is on all my little books that I had as a kid, even as a little kid, I, I would draw on all the books like, you know, most kids do, and which would drive my mom crazy because she spent a lot of money on these books. <laughs> and uh, so I would draw cars in there and, I, and every car had to have an antenna on it because they needed to listen to the radio. And, that, and I thought that was kind of odd. And it didn't mean anything to me until much later that, you know, this kid was so fascinated enough with radio that he had to put a little antenna on every car <laughs> so that all the drivers can listen to the radio. <laughs> So anyway, you fast forward and I have this transmitter and I'm able to uh, start doing things on the radio. And that kind of stopped the rocketry for a good number of years um, for me. And like Paul, by the time I got to playing music and all that, and I got the station actually sound good as in passing all the frequency responses on the record or whatever to get it to come out on the radio. It's like, you know, this sounds like the record. Everybody else sounds like all big and exciting. And and I just sound like the record. And uh, and. A friend of what, uh, well, stepdad to one of my friends was listening to us screw around with the transmitter in, in my friend's uh, room. And uh, he's going, you know what you need? You need, you need an audio processor. <laughs> and that's when my ears perked up. A what? Tell me about this. <laughs> and he goes, uh, I don't know. It's a band. That, it's a box that splits the audio into three bands and puts them all back together. It basically makes a radio station sound louder than it really is. At least that's what my friend says. I was going, that sounds exactly like what I need. <laughs> oh, make us. <laughs> Now, how much is it? So, you know, I'm looking around and I, I think I stumbled across, this is where paths start to cross. Um, Mark Manolio, uh, who's in our support department, in his young years, he was chief engineer of Cleveland State's radio station. And I happened to pick up one of their, their program guides. And in there, they were thanking people for their um, uh, Radiothon donations because we were able to buy a new audio processor. Hey, that's what, that's what I need. So Flip and Mark actually wrote up what it is that they bought. It was an Optimod 8100 and XT2. And he said how much it costs for them to buy that because this is why they were so thankful. And I was like, okay, how do you make one of these things? <laughs> how do you make an audio processor? And that is where I started learning how to put one together. And, uh, that, and there's, there's a whole lot of steps between there and where yes. we are now. But, uh, yes. hey, our audience, Paul and I, we kind of need to understand uh, about the Omni 11 and this uh, uh, V3 and, and, and G4. So, yeah. uh, Corny, if you would just jump into into that, the overview, and, and then 
take a deep dive down into, you know, what makes this sound so amazingly good. Okay, cool. Um, it's basically, um, this G-Force here is building upon things. I started with the first Omni 11 release, which I have been calling the orange face version. That's how everybody would know. That's how you know if you have a G-Force Omni 11. If the screen is orange, you've got an original Omni 11 uh, running or the original algorithm running. Blue screen means it, not that it crashed, but the blue screen means the updated version or the new G-Force algorithm. And um, a lot of work went into uh, basically porting over a lot of stuff that I had in the analog uh, world into the DSP. And that was no easy task. Um, as well as some unique features that could only be done in DSP. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. It's this, the melding of the two technologies. And we'll get into what that all means. So we'll take a look at our first slide here, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, this overview, um, a, a number of bullet points here. Why don't you just walk us through these real quick and then we'll get in, into the deep dive. Okay, so um, basically some of the uh, features that we have in the uh, GeForce here is uh, are all new dynamics sections. So all new AGCs and all new limiters. Uh, the AGCs were improved upon, made more intelligent and, uh, and, and you know, compared to what was in the original Omni 11. And then the limiters are the biggest change. Um, the limiters in the orange Omni 11 were limiters that worked good enough to get the job done. Um, is you, is when you're working in any project with any company, you're given a timeline that you need to meet and, uh, and your resources to do it. And a lot of time was spent during the orange version developing the original AGCs. So there wasn't a whole lot of time left for the limiter. So I had to kind of do the best, make the best of what I can had time for in that case. Um, and so when it came time for working on GeForce, that's where I picked up. I picked up where I left off on the limiters and the limiters are actually what I wanted to do in the first place. So and they're very powerful. They're very smart limiters. They're able to operate quickly uh, without generating a lot of intermod distortion. So you can, you can drive, you can see them drive in the depths that you didn't think were possible to have with any kind of a limiter and have them be amazingly tran transparent. Um, not so transparent that it doesn't sound like nothing's happening. Like when you drive them harder and harder, it just gets thicker and thicker. And that's the sound that some people like. And if you want to have a thicker sound, you just drive them harder. If you don't want them to be as thick, you can drive them lighter. And you don't have a huge amount of loudness difference when you do that. They're, they, protect the, they protect the clipper, which is what you know the, the task is. Um, but in that process, they allow you to play games with it to alter your texture a bit without having to sacrifice too much. So that's the biggest improvement. Uh, the AGCs, like I said, they're they're more they they're more intelligent. They're driven more by the program content than the previous AGCs were. The previous ones did have some features to do that, and they're pretty groundbreaking in their own right. When I developed those, um, the big thing is with the original Dynamics. A lot of that work was uh, early DSP work that I started around 2005 or so, and uh, and the GeForce is built on all the things I've learned since then, which is quite a bit. And the other thing that's nice about GeForce is because of the way the intelligence are all tied together in the processor, it allows end users to very quickly tune the processor to where they want. Uh, the typical setup time for the majority of people are, is about 15 to 20 minutes, even in a demanding market to get the box 90% of the way there, which, uh, people are not used to. They're used to it being more like a several weeks, maybe a few months process uh, using uh, past technologies uh, hey, and, so, and some existing ones. Hey, Courtney, I think right now is maybe a, a good time to interject something I, I meant to say at the beginning of our talk here. And and Paul, I bet you have your own opinion on this, but let me tell you what I happened, what, uh, what, what happened to me. Uh, I had uh, I have an Omni 11 in my office here in Nashville and I love the sound of it, no problem. Uh, it prints really well, as as Frank likes to say. <laughs> um, uh, but then I got the GeForce plug-in or uh, upgrade, and when I put that in, you know, I've got, like many people, Paul, I bet you got the same thing. You've got your favorite set of songs. You know every little tiny mm -hmm. waveform of that song, and you want to hear it through a processor. And so I, I put a few of my favorite songs in. My fir The first one 
I put the song in. It was probably something by Fleetwood Mac. And I, and I started playing it. I was listening to it on a couple of small uh, Genelec uh, monitors here. And I'm telling you, if, if my jaw could have hit the floor, it would have. <laughs> Uh, now, I didn't have a mod monitor. I had no way to mod to check the the you know the modulation percentage. I'm just listening to the processor, and my brain just went, "Oh, I like this." <laughs> it's and, 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 and Paul, you and I haven't got a chance to talk about this, but I've told Corny this: the song sounded whatever it was, whatever Fleetwood Mac song it was. The song sounded the way my brain always imagined that song should sound when processed wonderfully. And I could never describe that before hearing Corny's G-Force upgrade. But when I heard it, I thought, that's it. That's the way that song should sound. You hear every detail, and yet it's so aesthetically pleasing. It's it's audibly pleasing that my brain just went, oh, I like this. I like the way this sounds. I could listen to this all day long. I would like TV. I would like every radio station to sound that nice. <laughs> when, I'm a little biased because the first time I ever heard it was in Frank Fody's uh, on his workbench, the G-Force plug-in with the D-Clipper. And yeah. through his monitors, um, it was so easy to tune the box. It was so easy to get a sound and pick a preset that, that would work well. And what is it with Fleetwood Mac and tuning processors? I think we all default to Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> Well, they're so they're so well produced, and and uh, you know the, the the layering of the audio uh, from the spectrum point of view, and the and the uh, I mean you know from the audio spectrum low to high, uh, the different voicings, if you will, if you will call instrument voices, they're just so well arranged. So anyway, I, I, Paul, thanks for your insight on that. You felt the same way I did then, and I just wanted to give our audience a sense of okay, well, Corny's going to be spending some time talking about all these improvements. What does that do on the air? I got to promise you. I want to listen to this pro to audio through this processor because it makes my brain happy. That's the best way I, I can describe it. So, Corny, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to oh, give people a, <laughs> that insight. Please, go, please uh, you know, uh, press on. It's it's always nicer to have uh, somebody other than the designer uh, talk about that too, because you know you talk to anybody who's designing stuff, the designer is always going to say, "Oh, it's the greatest," and so it's nice to have someone else you know chime in. I, I like doing that. You know, if somebody else starts talking, I'd let them talk, as you just saw. <laughs> so, so go ahead. We, we so, hit the, the agent okay. page, and I think we're going to look at uh, some declipping action here now. Yeah, we've got a couple of features that were added that were um, revolutionary in their own right. Uh, one is the declipper, and the other is the dynamic equalizer. So we'll start with the declipper, which is something that Hans van Suften, our resident audio scientist, I guess is the best way to describe him. Um, he he worked on coming up with a solution to these, uh, the, the plague of overly mastered CDs where the, the, uh, in the, either in the recording process or the mastering process, and more often than not, it looks like it happens when they're actually making the, the studio recordings where they, they apply so much processing on each track that it's practically square waves as it is. Um, you could almost feed it into a transmitter. If they were to pre-emphasize it and put it on the CD, you'll be able to feed it right into the transmitter without any problems. Um, but, uh, but because we have to prep it for radio, it's got to go through a processor again. And so you have a problem without the declipper where songs that are recently produced sound kind of overly done, overly processed, very fatiguing compared to say an older Fleetwood Mac song when it comes up. So what, uh, so what Hans's process does is that it looks for these, these flat top square ways. I'm sure Kirk, you've got lurking on the internet, a whole bunch of discussions with Hans with more details on this. So feel free to look for those. Uh, but basically in a nutshell, it's able to tell where the flat shape, flat tops occur, regenerate using some math, the peak that was there or should have been there. And not only that, but also regenerate all the harmonics that were missing because, you know, don't forget when you flat top, you've just pinched off every harmonic there is. So if you, if you were to recreate the, the waveform, which a lot of declippers do, you still have the distortion of the harmonics going away and coming back. You may have gotten the fundamental, but the harmonics are still gone. Uh, so Hans regenerates all that. So it's very, it's, 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 it's his, his, the name implies the perfect declipper um, because once it runs through that, it comes out sound like nothing ever happened. Um, so we have that feature in there where you run the program audio through that. Uh, Corny, you I, say I, something? I, I, yeah, I've heard that, you know, some people cynically look at, at what we do with the declipper and they say, well, you guys just uh, declip it, and then you go clip it yourself. Well, I think we got to point <laughs> out that 
there is a huge difference in the design of both AGCs and limiters and, and clippers. And there's there's math ways to do things that don't care about how it sounds. And then there are clippers and AGCs and, and, and limiters that are designed by listening and tweaking the algorithm for literally tens of thousands of hours of, of work. And that's the difference between a product like or like the algorithms that you come up with and and, and uh, that Hans does and, and Frank does and just doing something in math because you can do the math. Um, so I just want to point out, n- n- no, we're, we're, we're declipping bad clipping and then we are doing our own very intelligent musical clipping. Would I, is that about right? Yeah, that and and the other thing is, is ideally, if you're going to since you have to clip in radio and it's like a necessary evil now, it's better just to clip once than to clip twice. Um, and the clipping that happens on the CD is typically not any type of perceptual um, distortion masking or anything like that going on. It's just brute force clipping. So when it runs through a broadcast um, process, um, not only are you double clipping it, but because the processing is multiband, what ends up happening is that you bring out those harmonics that are normally covered up by the music even more. So it makes the clipped audio that gets doubly clipped and doubly processed sound very fatiguing and and very tiring compared to when you just like, like the example I gave, like where the modern songs would sound like overly smushed and just, just hard to listen to. And then an older song comes through where it's just being clipped once and it's listenable. So that right there should tell you everything you need to know (laughs) just from listening to a processor without a declipper in it uh, right there. You know, that's yes, we're unclipping to clip again. And on the surface, that sounds like weird, but the proof is in what you hear on the air if you don't declip it, um, which is just about any box without uh, declipper. Say, it it just occurred to me, Corny, that we're uh, we're spending a a lot of time on this one slide. And I I bet you go into more depth in in each of these. So Mm -hmm. let's just let's just run through these bullet points, at least the ones that you um, talk more about later. And then Mm -hmm. we'll 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 be in depth on on the bullet points uh, that we get to later. So there's a dynamic equalizer. That's kind of that's I always thought you you equalize by adjusting the uh, input and output levels of the compressors. But Mm -hmm. that's not what this is, is it? This is a bit different. Right. Um, with the classic way of doing uh, dynamic EQ is using your multiband sections. And uh, the and what you really are doing when you do that is you're kind of um, uh, equalizing by brute force. So, yes, you get equalization uh, with your multiband AGCs, but it's by way of having... Um, more smash <laughs> if you will okay. more compression and that's how you're getting you know audio to fit with the within the will of the uh radio station if it were uh the we'll get into details on the dynamic eq or since that's the next slide we can jump over to that and yeah. and just go let's just let's go ahead and look at that the the oh, well let's see the per, the perfect clipper we, 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 covered, we covered that and right. uh, by the way there are other videos uh that are associated with the telos alliance's youtube channel where you can find out more about the perfect clipper by hans von zutphen but now let's jump into the uh, multiband dynamic e- eq and tell us you know why that's better than the way that okay. i always used to do. so what the uh multiband dynamic eq is i'll start by backing up a little bit because there's some history behind this um dynamic eq and uh, and it's this project made its way into the Omni 11 by way of the VX, um, where when the original Omni 11 was being unleashed upon the world, Steve was uh, our late great uh, Steve Church. He was in the middle of the VX project, and his complaint was that the best sounding hybrid that Telos ever had was the Telos Delta, and it was because of the dynamic EQ in the Telos Delta, but. Mm-hmm. But the, after that product went away, uh, Steve says we never had that sound since then. And and I want either you or Frank to please figure out how the dynamic EQ works in the Delta so we can put that in the VX. So I was knee deep in alligators with the 11 at that point, but Frank had some bandwidth. So he took a Delta and went back in the lab and studied it and reverse engineered it and figured out how it worked and spit out an algorithm. Uh, that he sent to our engineers that are working on the VX, uh, which, uh, which made Steve happy. But along the way, Frank goes, uh, Cordy, this dynamic EQ, it's it's amazing. I think this may have some application for audio processing. Play with it. So he threw it my way. And then uh, sometime later, I had the algorithm up and just kind of poking around with it. And I was 
working through a problem. So I decided just to play some music through the dynamic EQ. And one of the things that struck me was the same thing that Frank mentioned is that the, the, the unique property of this EQ is it doesn't care about levels. It could be quiet music. It could be loud music. It just does its thing at whatever level you feed it. And what it's doing is it's just, they're, they're looking the, the multiple bands in the EQ are looking at what they're doing relative to their neighbors. So it's kind of like a ratio kind of thing. Um, so it's really transparent when it works. It does, it makes things more consistent, but it does it in the way where it's not doing weird things to the audio necessarily. So to prove and, that point, go ahead. Yeah, with, with the word dynamic, uh, uh, this isn't just an equalization curve that you set this, this EQ moves, but it always sounds the way you wanted it to. Yeah. Yes. Because what's happening since it doesn't care about the levels, it's not, it's not getting EQ and by way of hammering down your levels all the time. So you don't have this gain reduction thing going on. You don't have this thresholding effect, which is the, the key. There's no threshold to work against. It's, it's when you're, when you're, when you're doing that, Cornelius, there's actually a portion inside the software when you look at the front panel that, it, that you mm -hmm. get to see real time what it's doing. Yes. And equalize. Yes. It's a great feature. And, and it's and it's fascinating look to look at and uh, and see what it's doing, because it's not always what you would think it would be doing. It would be doing because it's not a processor. We're used to seeing that kind of stuff happen in terms of gain reduction. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes what it does doesn't agree with what you're used to seeing. Uh, which is really cool. Um, so anyhow, the, what what drove it home for me was I was, I was playing a bunch of songs and through the uh, through the just had it playing on random on the computer back here that that plays my things randomly, and some Journey songs came on. And about halfway through a Journey song, I stopped. And it's like I don't think this Journey song sounds this clear because Journey songs to me from a certain era, you know, like separate ways and stuff like from that era of their their catalog sounded really muddy. It was just kind of midi and muddy sounding. And it wasn't sounding muddy sounding to me. So I decided to flip it and bypass. And it was a dramatic difference. And I switched in and out. And it did exactly what I would want to do to that song if I were the one mastering it, but not doing it in a way that sounded processed. So that's when I, that's when I heard what Frank was hearing with it. And so I kept playing around with it. And I developed, the, developed this into a, a four-band, quasi-five-band version from the original two quasi three band that the VX has. And so it's, it's a very cool process. And when you switch it in and out on the processor, you hear an equalization come and go, um, but you don't hear a change in texture. You don't hear a change in density, which is exactly what you want. So that's part of the magic that, that you were hearing when you alluded to, uh, when you listened to the G force for the first time in your room, Kirk, and, uh, and you were just kind of amazed because, um, Part of that is getting this level of consistency out of the music uh, that we would want without destroying the dynamics excessively to do that, which is what we're all accustomed to. So, so Courtney, uh, moving to the, our next slide, uh, you mm -hmm. talk about the top level overview and the master system controller. What what are we looking at here? Okay, so uh, one of the things in GeForce that that happens a little more extensively than what happened in the original version is that the um, the multiple stages of audio processing are made aware of what's happening in your program source um, so that they're all uh, can stay in sync, if you will, with each other. So what typically happens is when, when you have, have a wideband AGC and the wideband AGC is operating, it is the only stage in every, just about every audio processor that's totally aware of what's going on in your program bus. The next stage down from that is something that's being forced to operate on audio that was already processed by the wideband and then the limiters are working on something that's been processed before by other things so they're, they're not aware of what was going on they're only aware of what's in front of them so on the wideband agc uh the omni omni 11 g force in particular it's a little more sophisticated than the original one one the original one people loved it and they thought it was a great wideband agc um i improved on it made it smarter. It's operating across more bands and it's looking at a few other aspects of your audio dynamics and whatnot. So what I'm able to do then is to pass that information downstream so that the other stages are, are, are program aware, if you will. So what, whatever they need to, to, to stay in sync and not trash the audio too much, I can pass that information down. So this master system controller, what that in my analog box in the, uh, what, 
by box was called the audio chameleon at the time. There was this hard coded algorithm, if you will, it was a bunch of logic gates <laughs> on a board and they were just kind of hand wired to do whatever. And, and I called that the master system, master system controller. And it does a, 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 a subset of what goes on in the Omni 11 now. And so in the Omni 11, that just means the computer part of the pro processor, because all these digital processors are a computer. And I figured, you know, why not use that power? So that just means that I use the computer part to coordinate the um, what's going on in the other bands. So um, part of that is uh, in the the parts of this that are shared with the original version of Omni 11, which such as multiband uh, syncing and um, and uh, whatnot, which is the biggest thing that passed through is the multiband sync control. Um, that's all hap that all happens through the master system controller. And we also have intelligent gating where the gating on the multi bands not only operate within what's happening on each band, but they're also operate. They also can operate if you set it up that way, using some intelligence of what's going on in the main program bus to have some out, some influence that can override what each individual band would want to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, it also the overall base management, uh, we'll, we'll get to the, what we, we just remember the term, the PD page, because there's a quick setup page on the Omni 11 that's very powerful. And uh, part of what that does is like, if you want more bass, you turn up the bass and you get more bass magically. Uh, that was one thing that on the original, original version, something simple like that, I need more treble, I need more bass, make it thump more. In the orange version, you have to know how to diddle each one of those controls underneath the hood to get gotcha. it just right. Yeah. And on the Omni 11, because I'm making use of the computer to do this, there's a control that if you turn up thump, Okay, it's programmed to turn this, tune that, tune this by that much, tune that by, by that much, tune this over here by this much, and diddle these other controls that, you, that normally would be corny only access controls uh, to give you more thump um, or to give you more bass and do it in the way where it's going to be clear and not destroy the audio or create some other weird distortion. So everything is, is managed by the system. So that all ties into what this master system controller is all about. In fact, Corny, I think your your next slide has to do with a, with uh, uh, getting started and doing a yes. quick setup. So why don't mm -hmm. you talk us through that? How, then, you know, logging into the box, and then what the quick setup will do, and and, and you know, kind of why that that is very likely all you need to do is the quick mm -hmm. setup. No more, no more deep diving <laughs> in. Although I think you're going to talk about that later too. Yes, so, with the quick. Yeah. Setup. So one of the big things, um, the people that are very happy with the GeForce when they get a hold of the books and they follow the instructions that I'm, that I'm about to describe here, they're very happy with the GeForce. If there are people that are used to having processors with hundreds of controls, where the first thing you do when you get the processor is you dive into the hundreds of controls. And uh, people who do that kind of walk themselves into a, a corner very quickly. And when they call us, we say, use the, the quick setup. And I think people will think that uh, they're dummy controls or, or controls for dummies and they're really not they're way more powerful than the hundreds of controls that are there so, so with that in mind here's the, how you would go about setting up the omni 11. uh first you kind of go before you put it on the air you want to go through and just kind of make a note of what each one of the presets sound like and make a note of the ones that sound closest to what it is you're looking for um once you have that and you have a a, a subset of presets you want to aim for you can go ahead and pop it on the air or put it on overnight or put it on the backup chain or whatever you want to do however you evaluate the box and you start with those presets and you see where you are in the market. Maybe you're, maybe they're a little too bright. Maybe they're a little too murky. Maybe they're not loud enough or whatever. So with that point, you go to the quick setup page and uh, the quick setup page has a few uh, controls that, like I said, are very powerful. So if you need a little more low end, you can turn up the bass. Great. If you need more loudness. Well, try turning up the clipper drive a little bit more, which is your brute force loudness versus distortion trade-off. If it's too loud, which I've run into a lot. Some of these presets are just really loud for the market. They sound great, but they're really loud. Just turn down the clipper drive and um, until you match the loudness that you want. And uh, likewise, treble, if it's too bright, too dull, whatever, you can do that. And you also have access to the stereo enhancer controls. So they're basically everything that a PD would ever ask me for whenever I've been visiting. It needs more sparkle. It needs more of this. Uh, I, need, I need more thump. And it's got the PD words on it. So you just aim right for those controls. Um, yeah, and in fact, you call this on the slide here the the PD screen. So, can can an engineer who's let's say you're an engineer and you're pretty good at processing, at least with previous processes you've had, you put the Omni 11 with GeForce in, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know a lot of engineers uh, are in total agreement instead of fighting with the PD or going back and forth. 
this say here, PD, here's access to mm -hmm. this screen. Don't use other screens, but get what you want with this screen. Mm -hmm. My question is, are there things on the screen that a PD can hurt the station with, or is everything here going to be pretty safe as long as your ears are reasonable? Everything on the quick setup and the other tab, we'll talk about the base effects tab. Those two are the, basically the ones that you could feel free to open up to the programmers. And you, the, about the only thing you can get in trouble with is, is if you drive the clipper drive too hard, trying to get ultimate distor uh, ultimate loudness, you'll, you'll cross that line of loudness versus distortion for your market. But that's a pretty easy fix. You back it back down again. Um, so the, it's very easy. Like if you walk yourself in the, into somewhere where you think you've gone so too far, you can just back down this one control. Uh, so it's I, much easier than trying yeah. to figure out which one of the hundred controls that were in <laughs> the deeper end that yeah. you did wrong, you know? <laughs> so I, I noticed that the, your, your quick setup page, uh, already has, uh, like, uh, well, it's got a variety of things. Like you mentioned the clipper drive, limiter drive, it's got presence, mm -hmm. treble and sparkle, stereo enhancing, stereo enhancement density, but it's got bass and bass thump. Now, so that right. seems like all the bass controls you need, but but wait, there's more. Right, there's more, yes. So let's look at this bass. Why is bass so important, and why do you have so many controls available for it? Because uh, each format has its own requirements for low end, uh, and especially when you get into anybody playing modern music now or anything that's fa fairly current. That's a that's a really big deal because bass will blow holes in a lot of mid-range and highs. It's where, mm -hmm. where I've noticed that... Uh, a lot of older generation processors fall apart is with bass. Yes. And 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 the bass and the variety of bass there is for a format nowadays is, is just all over the place. Because if you're a CHR, you're going to want that driving, kicking, thumping bass. If you're an oldie station, you're going to want a warmer, fuller kind of bass, more rounded bass, or an AC station, or some combination in between. So um, so yeah, that's why there's so many different bass controls. And basically what bass effects does is bass effects fine tunes what the bass thump and the overall bass control sound like when you turn them up and down. So, um, so that's a, a, like a, a general idea of a, you know what's going on there. Some of the controls we're looking at here, you can figure out yourself. But uh, solar plexus, yes, um, I thought that was something we learned about in anatomy. Uh, what <laughs> what is solar plexus control? What is that? Solar plexus is a process that uh, that Frank Foti came up with where. Uh, he was in, well. Let's see. The inspiration behind that was a couple of Who songs and a, and another song where, for whatever reason, when they recorded the songs, the bass just stops at like 140 hertz or whatever, and it's just nothing below. Uh, and on this Who song in particular, Frank would always talk about how you know you can tell that End Whistle was uh, was just jamming along on the bass and doing all kinds of stuff, but you can barely hear it on some of those songs. So what? Frank came up with is a process that looks at the the base that is there and wherever it stops, he generates second and um, uh, second order and 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 and, and I think quarter um, harmonics of those base frequencies, and basically regenerates them, but regenerates them in a way where they 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 track the original both in levels and and how the frequency moves around. Some other versions of um, uh, bass synthesizers, as as you we we know them from the days of DJs, they kind of make this unilevel bass. You know, it's just kind of um, flatulates out bass of just one tone and and one level, and it sounds great at times. And other times, it sounds like it's too much. Other times, it sounds like it's not there. It's just not a perfect process. So Frank's process not only generates these lower harmonics, but they're also in relation to the to the main so if they do if they play the bass louder it gets louder if they play quieter it gets it's all tracks and it's and it's a very smooth uh, process so with that in mind you can play some of these older songs and you end up with bass that's rich and it goes down and you can have songs classic rock songs songs that when you play them they match something that's recorded today as far as the low end goes and another problem you had is that the older songs they couldn't just make the bass the way they do it now without causing problems with the records and your needles would mm -hmm. jump out of the groove and yeah. things like that so they had to master in such a way where they had to kind of restrict the bass anyway and you can tell that from like the 80s songs where 80s there's a lot of good bass in the records you could tell that there's a lot of cool bass going on and if you went to any concert when sound systems started to get become better you could tell that there's a lot of bass that's that they wanted to have in the record but they couldn't put it in there so sort of like brings that out Courtney, I've programmed a lot of classic hit stations, and I can tell you that a lot of these, you know, older songs from the 60s and 70s have never sounded better, richer, warmer, 
and taken on a, a different character without um, disrespecting the original source material. Right. So it's just corny. These uh, all these basin uh, effects uh, on this mm -hmm. page uh, are these all um, reset if you choose a different preset. They're they're set different uh, at different levels for each preset. They're all part of what makes a preset. Okay. But uh, importantly, though, something you touched on without probably without realizing it is that whenever you have processors that have a, a easy set of controls and an advanced set of controls, uh, some of them will the the easy and the advanced controls kind of cancel each other out. So if you if you went from easy to advanced, you've lost everything that was in the easy settings and vice versa. On uh, the Omni Eleven, these since these controls are coordinating things with uh, the deeper settings of controls, you can easily jump in and out of uh, you know the advanced controls and the easy controls. And what will end up happening is that things that you do under the hood end up influencing how the, the top level controls work and vice versa. So, um, but these controls are very critical because if you go into a preset and try to just adjust all the deep level settings to try to make a new preset and try to come up with a new base effect or whatever, you're probably going to have a hard time getting there without first going through and setting the top level controls to be as close as you want, as you can get with those before diving in deep. So um, they're very critical. They're not just, you know, they're not just dummy uh, controls for dummies. Gotcha. So, so just to just put a cap on, on this, on the process of getting set, uh, pick a preset, you know, listen offline, pick a preset, listen to all of them and see which one is closest to what you want. Mm -hmm. Then use the quick setup uh, to, to do any further tweaks that you may want. Mm -hmm. And then if you're, and then if there's still something that you think you want to play with, then you could go into the deeper settings. Um, and by the way, you can save these presets all along the way, right? Right. Uh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like you, you got a preset called, I don't know, Nashville dash Kirk dash. Yes. I don't know. I'm up to 53 now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and that's an important thing. Once you think you've hit a milestone and I think this is good at that point, save it. <laughs> And sure. then you can tweak some more because you you don't want to keep going. So you say, man, I had it and I don't remember what I did. And man, I wish I saved that one. You know, you don't want to get yourself in that in that kind of a position. Good deal. So. Cool. All right. So we got we've covered the uh, the quick setup and, and the, a lot of the base effects. Uh, what would you you know, the next slide here. Do you want to take this on the smart RMS AGC design? This is mm -hmm. pretty intelligent what you've what you're talking about here. Yeah. Um, now this gets into some of the some of the things that when I was messing around in the basement with the audio processor, um, in my analog boxes. One of the things that I that was an advantage and uh, to me, and this is something that Steve, Frank, and I would have like conversations over dinner about because we all kind of were in the same boat with the the technology that we've developed with the Telus Alliance here, and that the the advantage I had is I didn't know that most of what I was doing was quote unquote, the wrong way to do it. Um, and because of that, I they, they came out with some very unique algorithms that uh, you just haven't run into anywhere else. Maybe you'll have it now if, when people start copying it, but up until now you didn't have that. Um, and one of which is the unique way I, I went about making RMS control. Um, being a kid and and learning all this, and quite frankly, some of the stuff just was over my head that I was reading at the time, uh, because I just wasn't that advanced in my knowledge of of the science of things just yet. Um, but I knew what the goal was. So RMS, you want to be able to ride through through the audio. You don't want to react to peaks or anything like that. So the system that I came up with and and further refined like crazy in DSP because you can do that um, was a way to calculate that stuff. Typically, when you have an audio processor doing RMS control, uh, they're typically using like a single, um, what we call an RC network, a resistor capacitor network to, to calculate the RMS value of audio. And anybody who's making an advanced audio processor, which most of us are, usually have some kind of a multi-network time constant scheme where um, there's not just one time constant. There could be multiple ones kind of chained together or some that kick in now and others that kick in later to try to make it sound smoother. And when you try to tie the two together, they don't play nice because the RMS with a simple you know, uh, calculator in it doesn't track what the complicated stuff is doing. So while it kind of makes it better at times, there's times where the two fight with each other and you end up with results that are just not consistent. Either it's too much compression or not enough or or weird things happen. 
And then the system that I came up with is, is that the RMS and the timing network all kind of work in parallel and they work off of each other. So the RMS is happening over a really complicated uh, ladder of time constants, if you will. And that's how they're kind of calculated. And in the end, I get the time, timing that's really smooth and really consistent. So um, then part of that, the key, one of the key features in here is, is an auto acceleration deceleration uh, algorithm where um, if the audio processor is running on your average levels and not much is changing, the, the algorithm pretty much is running on the time constants you tell it with the attack and release times. If you end up with a situation where the audio gets really loud for whatever reason, and that and the time that it's seeing to take to get from point A to point B to compensate for it can't happen in a way without having the time constants have, go out of their sweet happy zones, it would modify them. And an example of that in some of the older processors, if you have your time constant set to be where the processor is just kind of gliding through and it's floating and it's sounding really great, and the jock goes to play a, a, a sweeper, and the sweeper is really loud, which happens all the time in radio because jocks use the meter bridge to hold up the newspaper and not look at it. Uh, so when that happens, the <laughs> suddenly you end up with this, this situation where, where you get what Mark Manolio calls a whomping, where the things get really loud, and then you hear the compressors go, whoa, and then turn it back down again. Um, and sometimes when that happens, you may have stages further down where it gets into the clipper and it sounds more distorted at that point. So basically with the algorithms that are that I have in the 11, when it sees a mismatch happening and you get this, this great huge error uh, situation starting up, it will start to speed up the attack time on the, on the time constant so that the, the AGC can very quickly get itself into a happy zone. And as it gets into its happy zone, it starts to transition back to the settings that the user has on the front panel. So, um, and that helps a lot because they can take care of themselves um, during these situations. And this can happen while you're adjusting their processing too. Um, mm -hmm. When you're making tweaks and you uh -huh. end up making things drive funny downstream. And then after you get this one stage going right, okay, all right, now, now this part back here is not happy. So now I have to go and dig down in here and fine tune there. Okay, great. Now I got to go back to the front again because I can, I can go ahead and, do, and you play this game where you're going back and forth all the time. And what these algorithms can do is when you're adjusting like the one thing on the front front end, you may be driving something not quite happily downstream, but this downstream stuff can take care of itself in the meantime. And uh, so adjusting the the 11 in that regard is, is a lot more pleasant than some other processors or older processors. You know, the, the, this auto acceleration deceleration, this sounds like if you could take this algorithm and apply it to, let's say, Walmart, <laughs> Walmart, yeah, hold, hang with me now. Hang I'm following. I'm, I'm, I'm hanging. So what Walmart has 15 checkout lanes and, and two of them are open, right? That's the way it mm -hmm. always is. And, yes. and, and then what if they could detect that, uh, uh, you know, 18 customers were headed toward the checkouts and they'd go mm -hmm. ahead and take those people out of stocking and put them <laughs> at registers and the registers would already be open at the instant that the uh, extra shop shoppers arrived right. uh, to, to do their, their checkout. That's kind of auto deceleration and acceleration. Right. And and what I described it uh, specifically here was the excel, auto acceleration yeah, and yeah. deceleration. Um, that works in conjunction with the makeup gain settings. So what ends up happening is as the audio gets really quiet for, for uh, sub suddenly quiet, um, what will happen is that uh, after you fall below a certain threshold, and we'll get into that in a little bit, the release time starts to speed up a bit and then slow down when the when it's back into the happy zone that your your presets is designed around. And we'll get into that more specifically when we later on with the windowing schemes and all that. And that last what point, just design with the declipper. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Paul, mm -hmm. go ahead. I was going to ask, Courtney, I think it was on one of the radio processing message boards, you were talking about how you wanted to create a processor that held the sound stage. And when I, when right. I use those words, I'm like, as a programmer, that's it. Nobody had ever to me really described one of the goals of, of programming a radio station in terms of processing was mm -hmm. trying to keep a consistent sound stage, keeping everything right, kind of within the same ballpark, make it sound like it's all coming out of the same spigot, if you were. Is this the, the section of the box where that, that's achieved? 
Yeah, this the combination of this section and the uh, multi-band limiters, which have to be designed to work hand in hand with what's going on in the front uh, st uh, stage of the box. Um, yeah, and if you were to talk to me when I was younger, another term I would say was uh, that I want the process of the work but sound stable. Um, and when you hear the G-force, you will see that would take on meaning. Like without hearing it, that could mean any number of things. But when you hear G-force, when I say that, that that I want the sound to sound stable, no matter what you're playing through it, that makes a lot of sense when you hear that. That's kind of like been always a goal of mine um, from the very beginning. So the smart RMS AGC designed with the declipper in mind. Quickly, what does that mean? Morning. Okay, so when when the declipper started turning up in the Omnia Nine and all that, I knew it was a matter of time before it, we would want to stick it in the Omnia Eleven at some point. Um, and so what I ended up doing was modifying the RMS algorithm in the AGCs to allow for the the peaks that declipper will regenerate to come through. Mm -hmm. um, some of these newer songs, when you declip them, you end up with peaks that are more pronounced than even the older material before they started smashing it because you're kind of regenerating these huge transients that got just obliterated for their effect. And so I did not want the AGCs to start acting weird with that. And that's one of the reasons why you don't see the Clipper in the old orange version because the orange just didn't have that in mind. And I knew that some of those peaks would be so big that it would disturb some, some of the processes that goes on in the older AGCs. So these definitely have a provision in their algorithm to allow for the clipper to do its thing. And basically the idea is I don't want them reacting to peaks. I don't want they, their whole idea is you ignore the peaks, a big peak come in. Great. Just ignore it. Don't pet pass. Go don't collect $200. Just let it go downstream. Uh, and so we'll get into that more as we go along. Yes. Yeah, so on the next slide, the end result of smart AGCs, you've got four points here and, and if, point number one, you've got here smooth, consistent level control. And you know what? I think everybody says that, but you really mean yes. it. But, but the point number <laughs> two, I really like, and this, I never thought about this, but it's really important to have the limiters only work on peak energy, not on, hey, Mr. AGC, you missed a bunch of stuff here. Let me yes. handle it for you. So now I have to be part AGC and limiter. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So to, to talk about that for a second, what, what's the benefit for the limiters? Uh, hey, the limiters, let's keep you doing only your job. We'll, we'll take care of stuff before you. Yeah. It's a two pronged uh, challenge there because um, in theory, in my head, if the limiters only have to work on the peaks, then you can design the limiters in such a way where you can make the peaks still sound like they're there, even though they're being truncated uh, by the limiting process. So, um, so that's where getting it, where I was getting into before, where the AGCs just don't react; they just throw the peaks downstream. And you can see that on GeForce if you were to watch it on this, watch GeForce operating on the on on the front panel, you'll see that the AGCs just kind of do their thing. They can move fast; they can they can move quickly. But what you see is that the limiters are are um, jumping on peaks a lot more. Sometimes they could be as high as 12 dB or more. And uh, one of the early beta testers of GeForce before we released it, he um, he loaded it up, emailed me. This is an example, by the way, a little story. And said, I think your limiters are broken or something, or the meters are broken. I was like, uh, mm, well, actually, they, they're fine, but why do you feel that way? Because it doesn't, I'm seeing this stuff going on on here and it just doesn't sound like that's what's going on. And I think there's something wrong here. And it's like, oh, oh no, no, it's really doing that. Um, you know, and, and, and it just threw him for a loop. But after a while, he kind of got his head around it going, wow, these things are amazing. Um, and so a lot of that is due to what we'll talk about a little bit later on the limiters is the intermod control uh, in, that's happening in the limiters. Oh, well, you mentioned earlier the dual stage windowing system. Oh, and oh. That so I, I want to move to that, but if you got a thought to yes. finish, go ahead and finish that. Oh no, I think that I think that's a good spot to leave because I don't want to get yeah. jump too far ahead. I think I would jump too far ahead if I kept talking. So right, dual stage, I, you, I, you've I, got a graphic here where you show a, mm -hmm. a, a, a an LED style VU meter. What are we looking at here? What does dual stage mean? Okay, one of the challenges that's that we've had was trying to describe or get uh, help people get a picture in their head as to what's going on with all the different windowing options that are in the eleven. So basically you have two types of windows. Well, you really have three windows, but two that you control. The one is the, uh, the window control that's just called window. And what that is, is basically uh, a do nothing window, a freeze window. It's, it's a feature that was kind of inspired by the audio prism, quite frankly. Um, 
And and to back up a little bit, when I first ran into the audio prism, uh, while it was pretty cool for what it did at, in that time period, but the the thought that a processor can make a decision <laughs> really inspired me, and that's what drove me to create the chameleon and 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 onwards the um, the great grandchild of chameleon called Omni Eleven G Force here, where you have these stages that make decisions. So we starting with that, I I, I kept that basic function of the do nothing freeze window, which is just called window. So um, as well as a zone where the end users controls operate, which will be the second window. And the third one would be the makeup uh, threshold. So we're gonna go using this graphic here. The, you'll see the LED bar graph here and the top one says zero VU and, I, and that's colored orange. And basically that represents, if you were to have this meter, VU meter on the output of any one of the AGCs, when you hit that point where that zero dB meter comes in, that's where the processor starts to turn down the gain reduction. So, you know, anything over zero, it's it's turning it down by one, two, three, four, whatever, how many dBs you're overdriving it. So that's what that's meant to represent. So if you were to adjust the main window for uh, minus five dB on the front panel, anything, whenever you the processor goes into gain reduction and the audio is then allowed to drop by as much as five dB or whatever you set the window control to, and when that happens, it just doesn't try to correct the levels on the audio. It lets it fall by that 5 dB amount. When you hit the minus 5 dB point, or when the output of the AGC is 5 dB below the compression threshold, it starts to turn up the gain on the audio and bring it up to minus 5 dB and stop there. So that when things get louder, if you have a transition piece or, or any kind of dynamics, you've got that 5 dB of wiggle room happening on the, on the output. So just make things sound natural and not overly controlled. Um, below 5 dB, the processor assumes whatever kind of release settings you have on the front panel. Um, so if you've got it set for a medium kind of release, it'll do its little thing. And uh, so that's where that operates. Now, things change when you get to the makeup threshold. And just as a reference here, the makeup threshold on the front panel is, uh, in this example, is set to minus 10 dB. And what that means is that the makeup threshold is 10 dB below the window threshold of the audio processor. So when the audio hits minus 15 dB on its output of the AGC, in this example, it will start to progressively speed up the release time. So the, 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 more the, the lower the level is below minus 15 dB, the faster it's going to try to make the release happen. And it will slow down as you approach the minus 15 dB point. And then anything above minus 15 is running at the user release time setting. So that's what this graphic is representing. And you know what it's trying to show what it is you're doing with those two controls on all of the AGC sections of the Omni 11. Yeah, and, and this this idea of, of makeup gain, I was introduced to this by some of Frank's early design, makeup gain, and I, and I found it to be very useful in some unusual situations, like when a station, I was at a station in Houston, they'd put a caller on the air, and sometimes the, the well, they, they had a lot of gain available on their fader on the board, so sometimes they'd have it set way too high, the caller would be really loud, mm -hmm. and then on the air, it would punch everybody down, and so the jocks would talk and interact with the caller and you couldn't hear the jocks very well because the 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 uh the AGC stage was was pushing everything down especially in the in the mid range where the voices were so that's where i learned how to employ makeup gain how to adjust it maybe more aggressively so that uh even if they did have a real anomaly on the board like you said the meter bridge is just to hold up something you know <laughs> what newspaper <laughs> yeah newspaper uh that we, we fix that by by making the makeup gain uh, come in a lot faster, and so therefore we would w you could hear the jocks. The you know, the, the caller mm -hmm. would talk; they'd be super loud, and then the jocks would respond, and you could hear the jocks just fine because they're it, it wasn't it had no longer had a hole punched in it. So right. uh, I th th that that's all. I th this is and and you've added to that with this dual windowing, so that's pretty cool. Yes. Paul, uh, what, how's this helped you? To me, makeup gain was really first useful when uh, when in radio um, we became hard drive dependent. When it was just yes. three 
it was up at a console and there was nobody there and you were relying upon whoever did the voice tracking to have set the levels appropriately and sweepers coming in over songs. And uh, as a programmer, I was always very um, self-conscious about making sure everything was normalized to a certain level so that, uh, you know, there was some forethought put into how things were put into the automation system. Um, and I've always referred to as a processor as if somebody, you know, to somebody, a layman who, what, what does an audio processor do? Well, it's the final goalie on the audio of your radio station. It's mm -hmm. it's really the the last the last line of defense to try to make every to make every level come out of the radio sound um, sound uh, appropriate and uh, that's where makeup gain came into use for me. The interesting thing about makeup gain is it's how it operates exactly kind of changes slightly over time depending on who's designing what. So my version of makeup gain in the Omni Eleven G Force and is a little different from how the makeup game was employed in the earlier Omnias. The Omni 11 makeup game um, function in GeForce is different from the way the makeup game function operated in the, the orange version, which is why we kind of made a subtle change in the name to makeup threshold versus makeup gain. So, um, so yeah, so just keep that in mind too. The, the goal is the same, but the functions are subtly different over time as we tweak them and, and adapt to the way radio operates, you know, in each of the, during the design cycle of any of these processors, <laughs> Corny, be, being a, a, a hobbyist rocketeer, uh, you're you're comfortable with these big long words that sound pretty important. We're going to hit another one right now. A big phrase: oh. multiband AGC sync and intelligent mm. gating. Wow. Yes. Okay, that sounds like a ten dollar option or maybe a thousand dollar option. What what is multiband AGC sync? It, it, really? We 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 want to multiband this, and now you want to synchronize those? I thought the whole purpose mm. was to be separate. But go ahead and tell us what this is about. <laughs> okay, we'll start with the syncing. Um, the syncing is a function that people are always trying to find a way to do because you want the, an audio processor to be multi-band, but you don't want it to go crazy and, and move, all, move all over the place. So some processors have functions called band coupling to do this similar kind of task. And, um, and there's a big difference between what syncing is on the Omnia 11 and versus coupling. The Omnia has never really had coupling of any kind before because I think primarily uh, because Frank and I seem to have the same aversion to coupling. Um, and the, the example I, I like to give all the time that I can't stand about band coupling is usually you're coupling a low frequency band to a high frequency band. And the idea is that the reason you even split the audio into multiple bands in the first place is to try to prevent areas of dominant energy from manipulating energy, areas of, of least amount of energy. So in music and of any kind, it's the bass is always the most dominant part of any music. Even in the 80s, when we say there's very little bass, there's a lot of bass on 80s stuff compared to the high frequencies, even though we don't hear it that way. Our ears are funky because we're not as sensitive to bass as we are to the high frequencies. So when we record stuff for the humans to enjoy, it's bass heavy. Um, and now in this age and era when you can put bass on songs to make it even more enjoyable, your bass energy is even more extreme where some of the CHR songs that you have out now today, the bass could be at uh, 20 dB or more higher than the high frequencies on the record. Um, so for an electronics, it's looking at this and seeing all this bass energy that needs to be controlled. And when you, so when you have a wideband process happening, what ends up happening is a, is a, a phenomenon known as pumping, where every time a bass note hits, you hear all the guitars or symbols or vocals or whatever is at higher frequencies jump down a level to, to correct for that that big gain change and then it drifts back up again when that when that transition is over so you'll hear that on some urban stations that play rap music and the bass is pumping and the and the guy you can hardly understand what he's saying but as soon as the beat stops his voice gets really loud it's like and then the beat happens again it's and the voice disappears for a while so the idea with coupling is that you create a multiband, so you have the bass isolated in its own compressor and everything else isolated in its own compressor. So when the bass is going, you can let that bass energy be controlled without disturbing the high frequency stuff. The problem you run into is if you don't manage how that what's going on, you'll end up with the bass texture changing all the time on you, where there's moments where the bass might be too much because the band is recovered all the way. And there's times when their bass could be too little because it's taken on more gain than the stage up ahead. So the idea of coupling is that you control it so that 
if, if the base ever tried to release any higher than the highs, it would it would not. So the so that worst case, you're you're flat. Now the problem you run into is is the when the reverse happens, like on an intro or something where there's a great little bass line going and everything is fully recovered. It sounds great on the air. And it's like, wow, listen to that bass. It's just driving. And as soon as a guitar happens, and if it's a little louder than the bass and the master band turns down on the guitar, it'll take the bass with it. So once the guitar notes hits, the bass just vanishes on the intro. And that's a classic um, two band processor thing that we've all had to fight in the 80s. And I've always just defaulted just to just turning off the coupling and using some outboard wide band to kind of manage it in the meantime, because that would drive me nuts. So I never liked coupling. So what I came up with in the analog box is a function called band syncing, where you modify the time, the timing of the bands um, instead of trying to mi- manage their levels. So in that same scenario, if you have a song where um, the bands, you know, you got a lot of energy in the bass, it'll let the bass, you know, do its thing, turn down on the bass to keep the from disturbing the highs. And as the bass recovers, let's just say you you set your band syncing at zero dB. So that means that if the if the band the bass band and the master band are equal in energy, and the and the bass goes away, the bass band will stop at the same gain reduction point as the mids. Now, if the mids were to recover, the bass will follow it. And if there's bass that comes in the band, it'll move down on its own and then tend to go back to where it is. Now, uh, what the difference is now is if something happens, like if you have an intro and you've got this great bass point coming because the bass band has pulled up the bass and a guitar happens and the master band moves, rather than dragging the bass with it, it just tells the bass to stay there. I'll be back later. And it'll go ahead and turn down and leave the bass band where it is unless there's bass energy that'll make the bass band move, then it'll move on its own as well, but it's not going to be dragged around by the master. And as the master comes back in, within range of the bass, they'll release together at that point where you set the threshold. So you can set the th- sync threshold to be minus five, you know, zero, which will be even, or you can give it an offset by setting it like minus three, which means you'll let it go up by about three dB and then wait or five to go up by five dB and wait. So you're in control of the where that freeze point is. But the point is, when the master band has to go and chase a loud sound, the idea is that it just tells the other guys that's tracking it, just stay where you are, guys. I'll be back later. And, the, and then that band goes and does whatever it's got to do. And the Omni 11, the way that works is the master band, you can assign the bands around it. You know, like, so the mat, let's say you make the middle band the master, the two next to it watch the master, and the two out so from that watch the band that's watching the master. And I think I have a slide that demonstrates that, and we'll, we will come back to that in a little bit. So that's the syncing function there. And now we have the intelligent gating. What the intelligent gating does now is that it allows you to run fairly low gates on the multiband and AGC, but make them smart. So what we do is when you turn up the intelligent gating, you're feeding into the multibands information about what's happening on the raw program bus. And this is how you make the multiband AGCs program bus aware. And so what basically ends up happening is you turn up the intelligent gating. Let's say you turn it up fairly high, maybe like minus 2 dB, minus 1 dB. What you'll start to see happening is this dance happening, where as the audio moves, the dominant energy in the audio moves around in a spectrum, it'll ungate the, the associated bands in the multiband AGC that allow them to build the RMS energy, but shut off the ones that, that aren't getting as much dominant energy. And it does it really fast and it does it really, really tight but you can still run the gating low enough where they're not going to stick. They'll, they'll, you'll think they'll stick, but they'll still recover when they need to because it's a smart process. I mean, the local gates still determine the absolute point, but the intelligent gating can override the local gate if the decision of the local gate is going to mean that it's going to cause something weird to happen. So the AG, so the low band might go, oh, right, time to suck it up. And the, and the master intelligent gating said, nope, just wait. And it'll override that command Disregard, as Captain John Luke Picard would say, in a freeze. Do they have arguments with each other? They just... <laughs> well, they'll try to, but the but the uh, but the intelligent gating is always the god control. So it'll say disregard, and they have no choice but to disregard their own local gate at that point. Well, and that makes sense so... because the, the the local gate, as you say, you know, the gate on a single band only knows what's going on in that band. It's not aware right. of what's going on elsewhere in the spectrum. But your right. overall control is aware of of everything, and it, it says, right. "Nope, nope, I know better." Yes. Uh, yeah. 
And, and the, you as the end user, when you would turn up the or down the intelligent gating, you're controlling how much weighting that control has over the local gates. Mm-hmm. So you can have it, you can make it so that the intelligent gating has almost no say in what happens locally, or you can make it where it has almost all say in what happens locally. So, but the low, but the intelligent gating doesn't care about the levels though. So as things get quieter and quieter, so let the multi bands release. It just cares about wh- whether or not their decisions are going to disturb the spectral content, spectral balance too much. We're going to move on to talking about the intelligent limiters now. But, Corny, I, I got to tell you, it, it is amazing to me. I, I don't know what I thought you developed to make algorithms that, again, to, re- to say what I said earlier, when I heard them, I just thought, wow, this is how the music should sound. But all these things you're describing, Corny, are all the, the little mechanical, electronic decision-making things that that go into that end result of, wow, this is how I yes. always thought it should sound. Right. So it's it's all it's all getting that coordination to happen, but happen in a smart way. So it's trying to give it some smarts. So uh, real quick, some smarts, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, and then we'll get to do the uh, intelligent limiters. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to make this really fast, but it's a pretty funny story, and it's always true. When we were first developing the Omni 11, we were all sitting around the conference room in Frank's, Frank Fodi's office, and uh, and the the hardware engineers were figuring, you know, uh, we're going to make this processor, we're going to put a quad core in it, and it's going to have X number of uns- insane number of gigaflops of of, uh, of of power available. And uh, and the comment was, so, you know, you guys will never run out of uh, space. You have a hard time filling it up. And Frank sits back and goes, I bet Corny can fill it up. Because <laughs> he knows how I, how I think. And sure enough, I mean, all these versions of the Omni 11, I end up, by the time we get done, it's running almost at max capacity on the CPU because I'm just forcing it to make all these decisions all over the place. And in GeForce, I had to figure out how to make the old stuff more efficient so I can shoehorn in more stuff. So that's more decision making. <laughs> well, well, actually, this does go back to what you said earlier, and you've told me in previous conversations. Look, we've got the algorithms down, and and you've modified or, or added to those. But you said, hey, we've got a computer here. Let's yes. use it to right. ha- add some overall intelligence and oversight uh, to tell these guys how to operate and when they should use their own right. brains or I know better and I'm going to tell you how right. to operate. That seems to be a lot of your mantra. Yes. And again, it all came out of when I saw the prism. It's like, ooh, smart audio processor. Mm. The imagination ran wild from there. <laughs> so, right, yeah. So, so anyway, keep staying on track here with the limiters here. Yeah, intelligent limiters. So one of the big things that's different on, on the Omni 11 GeForce, and I, and I touched on this earlier in this interview, is that when people look at them, they see that they're doing a lot, and but they don't hear it. Um, and they're, the way these limiters are working the way I've always liked my limiters to operate. Even the analog ones kind of worked in a way like this. What I couldn't do in the analog world that I could do in DSP is to have the power to analyze things to minimize intermod distortion. And to be frank, I wasn't as sensitive to intermod distortion even at, when I came into Omnia here as Frank Wood is. And Frank hates intermod distortion on limiters and clippers. It's just, it's the thing that just caused him to have the, the nervous twitches when he hears it. And, it, and it's, it's an unsettling thing to watch when you know you've got it wrong because Frank will have his little, his little twitch of irritation when he's listening to it. Um, so I'll come up with limiters that were nice and responsive and they'll move fast and they'll do all this cool thing. And, and Frank goes, it's, it's good, but there's, uh, there's some intermod in there, bud. And, and here, let me show you an example. And he'll loop a drum thing he heard somewhere else in the song. And here else, and he'll flip the source. Here, 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 the transients are clear. Let me, let's flip back to this. It, it's just, it's just, it's the intermod. It's just too much intermod, but so here, let me show you. And he'll slow it down, you know, to where he would do it. See, now it sounds better and it would sound better. But then the limiters are kind of like not doing what I want them to do uh, in the processor. So the challenge on the limiter was to come up with something that would make me happy and would pass the Frank Foti test. Um, so that forced me into a lot of work <laughs> on these limiters. It pushed me to really go to my limits on these things here. So basically the core of what's happening in these. Uh, well, before I get into the core of what's happening in here, let me hit some of these uh, points here that we're going to be talking about. The the limiters and the, uh, the 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 goals of these limiters is that they had to have kind of a positive response. Like I said before, they had to be able to get in, get out, and and the, when you do that the right way, you get more loudness out of the box. Um, 
And if the uh, RMS energy is, is during the trans transition, there's points in, where the, R the RMS stages may throw some challenges the, by way of the limiters. So the limiters have to be smart enough to handle themselves during those transition periods while the AGCs are settling in without causing any audible effects. And also, if we can make the limiters aware of the program as well, you can make them even smarter and they can make even better decisions and sound even more transparent. So we had to, so the goal was extend that computer control that you have going on in the AGCs into the limiters, which is something that was not in the orange version of the Omni 11. The limiters were their own little island. And at times you can get them way out of sync with what's going on in the, on the input because they just didn't know what was going on in the first place. They could only operate on what they could see at the time. And then the, the one thing that I wanted to do was to give the end user the ability to adjust their inner mod trade-off to a degree on the limiters because there are certain things that actually sounds good with a little bit of inner mod, uh, bass being one of them. Um, if you, and in the earlier Omnias, the way you handled that was, you know, Frank would design feedback stages for the bass and feed forward for the, for the high frequency stages. And the feedback would give you some of what we would call that friendly intermod, where the bass just sounds bigger, rounder, fatter. Um, and where the feed forward stages don't generate as much intermod distortion. So the high end sounded cleaner and clearer. So that was the way we handled that in the early Omnias. And I wanted to be able to have the ability to be flexible enough to tune that process. So just so you know, all the stages in the Omni 11 are all feed forward by design. But using the smarts in the side chain, which is something I never really got into, I'm able to add the good parts of feedback into the feed forward stages by doing them in calculation in the computer, um, making these effects. And so you get the best of both worlds on here. So being able to tune these, the, the way the limiters operate, uh, you can dial in a certain amount of friendly distortion into the limiters or dial it out. If you set them at zero, you, they, they run pure. Uh, so you can adjust to your, your tastes, if you will, but never to the point where it makes Frank nervously uh, upset over what he's hearing, <laughs> so which is part of the challenge. Um, and because of the smarts that are in there, they're able to work seamlessly with the AGC. So there's a trade-off where, like I said, the AGCs ignore peaks. So if you throw a peak at the limiter, they've got to be able to handle it. So these limiters here are happiest when they're dealing with peaks. The more peaks you throw at them, the happier they are. So as a result, mm -hmm. they work really well with the clipper, <laughs> you know. So on this next slide, I'm seeing you've got a diagram here, and uh, I couldn't help but notice the uh, the orange block, uh, mm -hmm. some control from the system controller. That's yes. the, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you've you've <laughs> got a, 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 a few other paths here: a detection and timing, the low IMD conditioning. Uh, is that yes. the low IMD that that Frank uh, developed some time ago? It's along the same I, same lines of what Frank was doing in the clippers, mm -hmm. but this is in the limiters. And basically, ah, okay. what what happens is that. There's an algorithm running on the limiters that's always that's constantly looking at what's happening with the waveform shapes. And the low IMD conditioning is modifying the time constants in real time very quickly to keep the intermod distortion at a minimum at all times, no matter what you're feeding at it. And that's the secret behind how they're able to you can drive them so deep in, into gain reduction on the limiters and not really have it sound all that bad. And and from the system controller now, what they do is they modify the timing networks on the limiters. So there's these mode switches that are both in the AGCs and on the limiters. If you set the mode switches to zero on all the modes, you've basically shut off most of the smart control of the gain reduction that, that's going on in both the AGCs and the limiters. And they pretty much run like a flat on, um, like an old school processing. So a trick you can do with the 11 is to make a preset, your favorite preset, save a copy of it, and then go in and turn off all the mode switches and save another copy of that same preset. Then you can AB between the two and you can hear the difference of having this, this system controller manage the time constants versus letting them run on their own without any any uh, supervisory control from the from the computer parts. And, and I do I'm, that. Which one am I, am I gonna like more? Yeah, everyone likes the system controller mode more yeah. because it's not always really obvious what's going on when you hear G-Force. You, I like what I'm hearing, but you, but it's not obvious what you're hearing. So you can turn off some of these things and make a preset to A, B, A and B between the two. So when I do that, everyone goes, oh, yeah, that sounds like typical processing. And you flip it on. And then basically what I hear and what other people hear is that the audio takes on. It's, it's like taking a 2D picture and making it 3D. 
So there's a foreground and a background all of a sudden. When you turn them off, everything just smashes together like you're used to hearing on the air. So, yeah. This, so, uh, earlier uh, in the in the show here, in, in our talk, you spent a lot of time talking about the bass effects. And when yeah. Paul added that you know, bass is pretty important, especially because of the different styles of bass with different styles of music and different eras of recording. Now you jump into bass even more with a, a special section for bass clipping, and it's an intelligent bass clipper. So why don't you tell yes. us about uh, how to control that? And then the next slide, we've got a, a, a block diagram. Okay, basically, you have a few controls in the in the bass clipper here that allows you to um, tailor what's happening in that function. Now, the, the, the point of a bass clipper is to try to keep the bass from creating um, high-frequency intermod distortion on the main clipper. Uh, and this is all like, you know, hard, you know, square wave clipping here. So basically you have uh, a switch that's a clipper silk control. And what that is, is, is controlling how the main clipper is handling a lot of transients. In this case, in G-Force, it pre predominantly adjusts how the, the low end is going to sound through the clipper. So if you set the clippers control, the base clipper silk control to zero, you're going to end up with a little more kick to your low end. And as you have the base clipper silk turned up more and more, uh, you get kind of a more of a rounded kind of bass sound. So it's good for like AC or, or formats where they don't want it to be too thumpy or whatever. The next control is a switch called bass style. Um, if it's in dynamic, then that means the bass clipper is operating uh, in program controlled kind of uh, function, which means that whenever you have a moment where the audio is just bass or just a kick drum or whatever, it does minimal amounts of bass clipping. So you get the maximum impact of the bass. But if there's uh, other... Uh, frequency content that's there that could be distorted because of the bass being so high. It then turns down the bass uh, clipping threshold to the to the point uh, that's set on the bass clip threshold control, which is a user control. So if you want to have, a, you, know, you can set it so that it does a maximum of five, five dB of bass clipping, which is what's in our slide here, five and a half dB. You can set it to be as much as minus 12, but then it's going to sound a little bass anemic when you do that. But we give you the, the ability to adjust that as you see fit, which is a key thing to Omnia, by the way. I mean, we've always given you the controls and Omnia processors to allow you to run the full range. And um, so that's always, or as Frank says, you've got plenty of rope to do whatever you want with it. You know, if you don't pay attention, you can hang yourself with the rope. But but we've always given you that flexibility because uh, if you want maximum performance. I wanted to say, Cornelius, is this processor seems like it plays well with any format. Why, thank you. <laughs> that, but, that's been a goal is to try to get it to, to be able to adapt to a wide range of things. Well, there's been, you know, over the years, you know, this box might sound better on this format or this box doesn't fare so well on this format, but, but the Omni 11 seems to behave well with all formats. Well, thank you. So um, sales, sales hat off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, back in, in the uh, more of why, yeah. why it sounds yeah. good with all formats. And I would agree <laughs> with you, Paul. Uh, but I just thought, find it amazing that that, uh, that that Corny's been able to take so much of what we've learned over the years and add his own desires and intelligence to this and indeed make a processor that sounds great, uh, whether it's light jazz or chamber music uh, or rap, uh, uh, R&B that came out of Motown or <laughs> stuff that comes right out here and out of Nashville, Tennessee, uh, or, hey, at, right out of Austin City exactly. Limits, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. Us, Kier, one of the things that um, that drove some of this stuff that's going on in the G-Force, oddly enough, is not the contemporary stuff, but... Uh, a lot of classical stuff. I like listening to classical stuff. And the thing that drives me nuts on classical radio is that you usually hear the processor going more than the music. And uh, in, in, in that comes across in any number of ways. And the one that's most annoying to me is that synthetic sound, as I call it, where the orchestra just sounds like it's constrained to the point where, you know, you get these artificial harmonics barking out of things. Violins sound overly shiny and splashy and stuff like that. So a lot of these controls that are that are in here that allows the synchronization and coordination of the stages are all things that came out of me wanting to make it so that you can make the processor play nice with classical. And there's a fair number of classical stations that are using Omni 11 and Omni 11 GeForce, and they're very happy with the results where they can be have some dial presence and sound consistent, but still sound like an orchestra. So anyway, uh, yeah, I do want to jump back on the bass clipper thing here <laughs> after yeah. that fun little detour. Um, the next control you have on here is your bass clip smooth control. And that controls how 
how smooth the waveform is going to look when it's when you have the clipper active. So if you have that control set to zero or somewhere close to zero, it's going to be more of a hard squaring effect. And the more you turn it up, the more it's going to try to round out the edges of that bass to make the bass clipper sound smoother. Um, some CHR people, some hit music folks like to have a little more uh, slam in the bass, as they call it. So sometimes making the bass a little edgier, a little squarier, or give you some of that impact on the uh, on the bass kick drum. Some rock music, you can make the bass uh, kick drum sound a little more rock concert-like by kind of squaring it just slightly, a slight bit. Uh, you have a bass clipper drive, where if you're if you're punching out the bass pretty hard in the in the front stages of the box, sometimes the bass could be a little bit much, but you're not quite sure why. And sometimes it's just that maybe just turning down the bass clipper drive is enough to oh that okay, that opens up the bass perfect. Um, so that's what that control is about. The bass clipper tight control. Now that controls how how basically it's almost like a ratio that I came up with on the bass. So. If you have that control turned all the way up, no matter how much bass the front end throws at the bass clipper, the bass clipper is going to hold it at a predefined level. Um, by turning that control down somewhat, it allows a little bit of of when the uh, a play. So the harder you hit it, it might let it out a little bit more and, and, and a little bit more depending on how much the front stage is hitting, hitting it. Um, that could kind of give you the tight control of bass that you might be looking for while still allowing some dynamics through on the bass. And you want to, and the way you adjust that, you adjust it so that you don't have it giving up uh, the tight control enough that it's causing problems with uh, distortion, but it, it can't open up things and let the bass breathe a little bit. And the bass punch control is um, controlling um, how aggressively it allows the bass to bang into the main clipper for a short period of time. And that control interacts with the bass thump control um, in, in the quick setup screen on the bass. So those are some of the controls that are there that's available to you in the bass clipper. And these are all like just advanced controls. So do play around with the, the quick setup and bass effects first. Chances are you could probably get what you want with a combination of a preset and those settings in the quick setup and bass effects. And this, these controls here, you play with them very carefully, but these are where you go and make your own customized preset for your own custom sound. So moving ahead to the uh, the block diagram uh, I, the, for the intelligent bass clipper, can't help but notice there's that orange block again from the yes. system controller. Yes, and that's where the bass thump control. That's part of where the this, the main computer reaches into the back, far back end of the of the dynamic sections of the audio processor and manipulates the bass clipper, so that can can coordinate it with what it's telling the AGCs and the limiters to do as you're playing around with the front panel bass controls. So basically, the way the bass clipper works is it's looking at uh, what's going on with the dynamics of the audio and also when the frequency balance of the audio, and it's determining based on that stuff and with some input from the system controller when to actually activate the bass clipper and at what speed and what rate. Um, so the idea is to get, for formats that where bass is important, the idea is to get as much bass as you can on the air without causing a problem, but be um, uh, smart about it and get out of the way and get the bass out when you need it. Um, so yeah, it's that elephant through the keyhole thing in today's <laughs> world where the bass is definitely the elephant and the keyhole is everything that's going on from the Clippers. So you have to play all kinds of games. And and this all came about because people were pushing me with the orange one that they wanted more bass, uh, especially when these these EDM inspired hit songs are coming out. Mm -hmm. And EDM is this the new generation of top, top 40 software you have the song playing in this bass note that just drones on and on. Maybe it's this note and then that note and this note. And it fills up the whole song on the CDs and you get the programmers going, see, see, I'm playing the CD right here in my office. It's here. It just fills my room up with low end. Now, when I play the same song on the air and we'll wait for that song to come up on the air, see, it doesn't do it the same way. I was like, well, it's because if it did, then you're going to put distortion on the voices. And it's like this, and, you, and we'll play around with it, try to find that trade off. And, in the, in the controls that were in, G, in the original Omni 11 Orange, you could make it at times have have lots of bass, but then something else would fall off the cliff, and you have to make another set of adjustments. And it was always a trade off trying to decide exactly where you want the bass to really stick out. So that drove the development in this new bass clipper, where it's able to change itself more than the old one could, so they can get more bass over the air on average than you could with the than the original one. And a little bit easier so to do that it has to change modes like all the time on music and it's got to adjust itself 
to tune the different things to get as much of the bass as over the air as we can without destroying all the high frequency stuff. One of the key things with the, the G-Force here um, is the proper management of RMS energy and uh, intelligent RMS control. And um, so that helps to create a more a stable sound stage, as Paul puts it, which is one of the, the terms that I, I kind of toss out from time to time in moments of clarity. And uh, so that so that's the little key piece of the whole picture there. The other is is um, when you're adjusting the audio processing, the, the, the stages are all kind of self adapting so they can um, work with you instead of against you as you're as you're messing around with the audio processing. Um, and, and a lot of that's because you're basically when you're adjusting attack and release and all that, you're kind of describing to the computer, if you will, what it is you're looking for. And the computer kind of takes it from there and does whatever it has to do to try to give you the sound you want without you being too bogged down in the technic technicalities of all the controls, which is why you don't have like time constant numbers and all that stuff on this box, because you don't, you never know what it really is. You just want, I, I, I want something that has the sound of higher attacks and it just does whatever it has to based on what state that it happens to be operating in right at that moment to do what you're looking for. Um, so because of all that, we're able to make a, a nice smooth sounding AGC section um, and, and, the RMS system also is able to tell the difference between what's peak and what's not. And in this case, I tell it that uh, you, your job is not to worry yourself about the peaks. This is not your concern. There's other stages that deal with that. So it's able to pass that downstream. And the downstream stages are designed to be able to handle that without creating intermod distortion. So you end up with a more consistent, less fatiguing sound. And, uh, and you can basically hear more of the music and not the process of doing work to, to do what it has to do. do. Um, and one of the phrases that I, I kind of had in the back of my head, the whole, all the years that I was adjusting and processing is that you want to hear the music and not the audio processing. And uh, Denny kind of chimed in and says, you want to hear the voice, you want to hear the music, but you don't really want to hear the process or working to hear it. And I said, exactly. Great overview. Appreciate the the deep dive into some of the stuff in the block diagrams. Uh, you know, I'm not sure I understand uh, uh, even half of of, uh, of what the block <laughs> diagrams really mean. But obviously, you put a huge amount of thought into this and and know what section, what subsections talk to what, and how they can be overall controlled uh, by a master yeah. controller that has a lot of a lot of brains behind it. Uh, I, uh, we, we ought to base. Oh, I was gonna say basically what ended up happening was shortly a little while after we got the orange version of Omni 11 out and released the whole thing was okay now i got this out there and i made my first dsp processor now listen let me go and do what i really wanted to do in the first place so <laughs> um speaking of what you really want to do uh a lot of folks ask me about this new uh small processor the omnia volt mm -hmm. and people say well what's the difference between it and the omnia one and i tell them mm -hmm. that well the omnia one was developed before the omnia 11 and the omnia volt was developed after the omnia 11. is, is yes. that a reasonably vague but accurate description Yes. Uh, and the, one of the descriptions that uh, people have when they hear it, it's like it's like a baby version of Omni 11 in that you can you can definitely hear the family resemblance. And at first blush, you would you would say, hey, this thing is just about as competitive as Omni 11. And then when you really A, B them, you, what you hear is that there's a definite family resemblance. But then you can tell you can hear in the Omni 11 that there's like this greater detail, greater depth. So not to say that the Volt is not is a is not a. Uh, worthy it's definitely worthy it's so worthy that it, it's it competes very favorably with our old omnia 6 mm. and uh and many people have been playing with it. it's like wow this thing is actually like making the 6 sound old and it's like there you go it's it's designed to be a modern sounding audio processor and the other nice thing about the vault is that it was a it was truly the whole team working together and the rest of the team used the g-force as their benchmark as, as in terms of how the other stages were going to be designed and what they were going to do so so it's a very capable box, very modern sounding box, very today. I, I know I speak for Paul, and I'll let him speak here again in a minute. But, man, I appreciate <clears throat> you spending this time to take this deep dive with us. And we're uh, using this video uh, for SBE meetings and other, other gatherings where there are, you know, real engineers uh, that we're not giving a sales pitch to, but we're showing them how this tech works and explaining why it makes audio sound like, as I keep saying, like I always wanted it to sound. Paul, what are your yes. final thoughts on this? 
Um, I just want to uh, say how much of a pleasure it is to uh, to learn about this deep dive on the Omni 11 and what went into it, because uh, I've always been a big fan of audio processing. Uh, the first time I heard the 11, it was the fastest processor I'd ever been able to tune up. I think it took me 10 minutes, went through five or six presets, found one, and it was very intuitive. So I think you'll... Uh, you know, I think program directors that encounter the 11 for the first time, it, it, it may be the easiest processor. For, for me, it sure was the easiest processor I had to set up. And, and good job, Cornelius. Why, well, thanks. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. Corny, thank you again. And uh, for you watching, you. I, I hope you've appreciated and uh, enjoyed this presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope it's added to your learning of, of what is inside an audio processor and, and what makes the stuff that we at Omnia put in, in ours uh, make them sound ex extra good. Paul, Corny, thanks a lot. All right, now I'm going to go over here and listen to, listen to some fine vinyl. We'll <laughs> some see fine later. vinyl. Put some Dave Brubeck on, buddy. <laughs> All right, we'll see you. See ya.